Well, aloha, everybody. This is a little early. This is a uh, webinar coming from Waimea Valley, explaining the details of the propagation technique known as air layering. I've never really figured out why it is called that. I'm sure it happens in mid-air, but I don't see layers of anything put on. Um, we have an old book in our library by somebody named Macmillan, and it was written in Sri Lanka, which was Ceylon back then. It was written in the, I think, 1930s. And it talks about air layering, but that was an era that didn't have plastic like we do nowadays. And they had an amazing uh, technique to keep the air layer moist. They would actually suspend a coconut with a pinhole over the sphagnum moss of the air layer and drip, drip, drip. That was back in the day when I guess servants would would dutifully go and fill up that coconut with water every day. But we're talking about modern air layering using the miraculous uh, substance of plastic. And uh, I'm going to walk you through how to air layer, air layer things. But uh, let me first start off by introducing myself. I'm David Orr. I have worked at Waimea Valley since 1988, and I am a, um, my position is the botanical collections specialist. I make all the plant labels here, and I correspond with other institutions and exchange material and, oh, lots of fun things. And luckily, I live only five minutes away. But air layering is something that I have had a lot of practice with, and I'm Happy to share what I've learned. Um, the, I have made this sort of cheat sheet here talking about the two types of propagation. Propagation can be divided into sexual or asexual. And the sexual propagation is just from seeds or spores. And uh, asexual is when you're actually making a, a clone of the plant. You're making a genetic duplicate. And that is so important for the work that we do, because a lot of what we deal with are wild collected plants that in some cases cannot even be collected again. They're that obscure and that rare. And so the plants that we already have living here, we want to make identical clones so that what we have as a resulting plantlet from that original plant uh, is the same as what was found in nature. Um, and in many cases, when we have a wild collected plant, it came from the place where it evolved. And it's usually a very specialized thing. It might be threatened by all sorts of habitat loss. And you know, Waimea is just this sort of refuge for very endangered things like that. So anyway, for air layering um, or for asexual propagation, you can either do cuttings or root layers. And that's sometimes called mounding. I'd have only done that once with a tree from Africa where I saw there were already these kind of little growths coming out of the base of the trunk. And I just piled dirt around it. And sure enough, I had all sorts of plants pretty soon with their own independent root systems. But we're gonna be talking about air layering and the equipment you need for making it, for making an air layer. And the first thing on my list is a plastic sheet. And I can make three plastic sheets from a good old cork bag of a, a typical Ziploc bag. And I don't have any with me right now, but I prefer the, uh, the freezer bags. They're just a little bit thicker plastic. And I haven't had a situation though where the plastic is worn out before I get to the air layer. Um, also air layering is a art. I mean, it's not guaranteed success. I'd say if I, with my luck, I've, I've for every five air layers I, put on plants, I probably get three back. And it's just something that takes a lot of practice. And often air layers fail because water get in, gets into that uh, bundle of sphagnum. But I'm already talking about things that we haven't gotten to yet. And later in this, you're going to actually see a video of me air layering something. So I'm just going to talk about the equipment first, and then you can see the technique. And uh, I probably should have shown this first of all. Here is an air layer that's actually exhibiting little roots. This branch on this tree that I just chopped off, um, the air layer was put on uh, 12, 16, 2020. And I can see on the sides of the 
air layer that roots have already grown and they're pressing against the inside of this plastic now. And so what I'm gonna do is take that plastic off very gently, put this whole bottom part in a pot of soil. And then it, not only do you get an identical plant, but it starts a whole new lifespan. And that is just such a great thing about air layering that you really can get plants that might've been collected once 50 years ago, and you can keep on cloning and cloning them. So, um, so the plastic sheeting that we use, I'll show you how we cut them. You can get three uh, good sheets out of one of these bags. And I use an X-Acto blade. And just from experience, I know when it has a, the markings on it like that, I can make one cut there. Cut on the top. Then it's just a matter of opening up everything. So one, two, and here's the third air layering sheet I can get out of one Ziploc bag. And actually, this is the one I prefer to use because the seam here is kind of helpful when I'm putting the air layer on. It tells me how to put that right on the middle of the, what I call a snowball or a big round sphere of compressed sphagnum moss. So that is what I will be using for air layering later. The next thing on the list is uh, long fibered sphagnum moss. And here is some of that. Uh, we ordered this from Amazon. And this uh, is not the greatest quality. It does seem to have some things that we have to pick out of it. But I think a lot of the long fi fibrous sphagnum moss is harvested in New Zealand. I hope it's harvested sustainably. I know other sphagnum mosses are getting scarce. You know, incidentally, in Hawaii, we have an overabundance of sphagnum moss in one place where it shouldn't be. And it's at the top of Mount Ka'ala. And there's a boardwalk where they have many endangered plants you can see. But one of the problems is somebody must have dropped some sphagnum moss there years ago, maybe a century ago. And that has now completely covered the ground. And it's providing a whole lot more moisture than a lot of these uh, Hawaiian plants up there in the bog dwarf forest. Uh, want, but then they found out if they remove the sphagnum moss all at once, these plants dry out. So they're just experimenting on how to do that. That's too bad that invasive got into such a sensitive part of Oahu. Anyway, so uh, the next thing is wire. And luckily, this little piece, it probably has a hundred strands, of very skinny wire inside. And these are a little shorter than I want them to be. But luckily, Randy, who works in the facilities department here, gave me a 20 foot cable of this stuff. And so cutting off little six or eight inch uh, pits like this, I'm probably okay for the next 20 years. As you use this very sparingly, you know, three wires are good for one air layer. The next thing on the list is rooting hormone. And here is some that you buy commercially. Uh, this is one, a rooting hormone that's actually designed for more difficult to root plants. Um, but it's a white powder in here and you apply it to the plant with a toothbrush, which I thought I had out there, let's see. And the toothbrush just gives it a little, it's just a way of sort of rubbing it into the wound that you've created. But I'll get to that also later. And uh, the last thing is parafilm. And when I first started air layering, we did not have this miracle substance, but here it is. It's a very strange thing in that it has a uh, sheet of very thin paper on top of what I can only describe as some sort of combination of plastic and wax. And this stuff stretches, see that? And then there's actually a slight elasticity. So when I stretch this around a branch, 
and then it sort of contracts a little bit, it really makes a hermetic seal. And this is what we wrap around both ends of the plastic after we've wrapped it around the, the wound uh, made by two incisions uh, or two girdlings of the circumference of the branch. Now, when you're out there in the field making an air layer, you uh, want to choose a branch that has these qualities that it is upright. Because if you tried an air layer, a sideways growing branch, that, that's remembered in the cells of that future plant. And that future plant will grow sideways too. So it's really good to uh, choose an upright one. And then the, there's plenty of leaves at the top because all of those leaves are gonna be making the energy, making the sugars that will uh, be turned into roots uh, because those auxins in the rooting hormone will cause this, you know, hey, I'm gonna be a root, a root cell instead of a branch cell from now on. <laughs> and then you wanna have a branch that's less than a finger width, ideally baby finger. Um, but you also wanna just test the strength of it too. I mean, this thing is gonna, you're gonna be whittling down quite a bit of the branch down to the very center part um, to get into the uh, fluidics or what happens is that the center of a branch is going to have liquid moving upwards uh, from the roots. And the outside of the branch, the part that we're sort of cutting away, are all these sugars coming down from the leaves. Photosynthesis has changed CO2 and into um, this, these sugars. And they are what will actually cause this thing to uh, form roots eventually. So you also want to make sure that the branch is accessible. I mean, I've tried to, sometimes I have no choice, but the air layer things that are way over my head. And sometimes I go to the extreme of using flagging tape or something to pull a branch down to eye level so I can air layer it and then I release it afterwards. But um, when you are looking for a place to air layer, uh, ideally, if you can find a place where there's a little bump on the branch, that might be an old leaf scar. And that is going to be a place where there's a lot of meristem underneath the skin or the bark of the, uh, of the branch. And that's what you want to cut into. It's sort of the slimy layer between the outermost part of the bark and then the inner part. And uh, that is where cells are, there are meristems there. They can decide to become a different type of cell than they were originally with the influence of the auxins or the rooting hormones. So let's start the video now and uh, I can narrate it. I'm not sure if it's already got some narration. We'll see. Good. So.
Okay, the next, the next step will be uh, putting on the sphagnum moss. And sphagnum moss comes in uh, bales or little sort of square plastic uh, bits of it where it's totally dry and doesn't cost a whole lot to mail. But what you do when you receive it is not just put it in plain water to let it soak up, but I add super thrive to the water. And that makes it even more nutritious for the roots to want to get into. But here's what we do is we put the sphagnum moss in one of these uh, whole bottomed uh, pots. And then I put the dilute solution of uh, super thrive in this pot and just put this in. And that way the sphagnum is soaked up all the sphagnum, all, this, all the uh, super thrive solution. And now here is one thing that you have to do out in the field is uh, squeezing out all the extra water. And while I'm squeezing out the water, I'm also finding little sticks and things in the sphagnum moss. And I don't have to do this perfectly right now, but you get the idea that you have to sort of rotate it in your hand, keep squeezing, because eventually you just want this to be almost dry, just damp. Because for roots to form, you've got to have little air holes all through the uh, bundle of sphagnum moss. And this will just be, well, I call this a snowball. See, so it kind of inflates after you let go of it. And I'll make another one. And then the two of them, I'll just put uh, right, I'll just join them right over to that wound. And when they're completely covering that wound and sort of probably covering at least an inch of the plant above and below that wound. I'll just keep squeezing them together so that the fibers almost interlock. And then I'll hold that whole sphagnum moss there with one hand. And the other hand is when I will get my piece of plastic. And here's that plastic piece that has the seam right through the middle of it. And I will put that into my unsphagnum moss hand and sort of transfer the sphagnum moss from one hand to the other. And then it's a matter, uh, you just have to kind of watch how I do it. You, you wrap the plastic around and then apply the, uh, uh, the wire. And when you tighten the wire, it's like a tourniquet. Um, usually the wire, depending on its length, will wrap two or three times around that branch. And uh, just, you want that as tight as possible. Now I think we uh, actually have that on this little demo that we did a while ago. Sometimes hard because you want this all with reachable when you're putting this on. So I usually will lay this plastic on a nearby branch and I'll have this sticking out of a pocket. And now with my two free hands, I'm going to make kind of a little crevice in each of these snowballs. Got that? Yeah. And then I'm putting these both on both sides of this upright wound, but and directly in the middle. So there's about an inch in the top and the inch in the bottom, which is not wounded. And now once I have that in one hand like that, then I take that plastic that just fell down and I lay it on top. And this is where this line is kind of helpful because you want that line to just go right through the equator of the... And I'm just changing hands and this is what's so tricky. And it looks really easy, but you'll see, you have to do this many times till you get it down. And I pulled that bag around, but I still have some tension on this. And what I can do is even put more tension by pulling it that way. And now I've got a nice gap at the top and the bottom. And I always do the bottom one first, where I'll take this corner and kind of just fold it all the way around. And there's something I see now that I don't want to do, and that's having this one little wick of sphagnum sticking out of there. So I'm going to pull that out, and sometimes you get the tissue effect where more come and replace it. But now I've got a pretty empty void there. And now I can just twist this around with one hand. 
And then holding it down there, I take my Your wires pocket. in my pocket, thank you. And you see the direction I wrap this around? The wire definitely has to go in that same direction. So I'm just putting about an inch out here, and then with my other hand, I'm wrapping it around in the same direction as the plastic. And I'm kind of continuing pressure on that each time that I'm pulling it around. And finally, I'll get to a place where I've got these two wires sticking out and I'm still putting pressure on it and I'm going to wrap them around once or twice and then I pinch that and it's like a tourniquet. I'm putting a lot of pressure on that little juncture closing that bottom part. And now I'm going to do the same thing with the top one. And I'm pulling this this corner, this plastic around, making sure all these little fibers are still kind of down with the ball. Do you pull so, it in the same direction? Yeah, it's the same direction as the wrap of the plastic. On the bottom. Are you making it snug or like... Really and yeah, I'm pulling it as much as possible because I don't want gaps in here. Okay. And this is looking pretty symmetrical right now. I'm holding this with one thumb first and then wrapping it around with the other hand. And did the same thing as the first one, where it snapped right out of my hand. But not too hard to replace. Now this top one, I and mean, this is a pretty tough plant here, but there's a lot of times this top one is really going to be a tricky thing, because you've got just this tiny little toothpick of wood. So often this top one, I will just hold it by these two ends here and once I get them together then I'll do the old same tourniquet thing and once I twist this tourniquet as much as I can I want the ends of these wires to wrap around the same direction as the plastic does So I'm going to put this right next to this top one. Actually, I'll do the bottom one first. Because the bottom one's the most... What we're trying to do is just trap all the humidity and air inside this plastic. And you see, as I wrap it around, I get to the point where it's transparent and, uh, and uh, translucent. And if I pull this out... Oops, that was too much. We can get the translucent part. I mean the transparent part to cover everything else. But the cool thing is that it stretches like that and really kind of makes this waterproof seal to the top and bottom of that plastic. Reinforcements. And again, the same direction as the wrapping of the plastic. Barber pulling around the naked top of this. I can go back and just reinforce it a little. And there's an air layer that hopefully we would see roots pressing against the inside of this plastic in another two months. Since the, it should you should see roots by then. Okay, what you just saw was uh, an air layer like this that was put on, and I was concerned because just after I put on the bottom, I noticed a little bit of the sphagnum uh, that was hanging out. And that can act like a wick. And just imagine a whole night of rain going against that bottom little tail of sphagnum moss coming out. That's enough to fill that whole thing up with water. And then once this becomes waterlogged, those roots won't grow. And this is a dead air layer. And here's an example, one I did on a hibiscus delphis uh, last year. And this is what you find, that roots just did not grow. They, uh, there's my naked part where I girdled it, and this whole thing had sphagnum on it for quite a few months, but eventually I uh, 
what I did actually was I potted this up just hoping against hope that this might have made some little vestigial root, but it died the pot. And I knew this earlier had failed. So um, I'm not sure what we're going to do next. I could answer any questions if you like. Yeah, if you want to unmute and ask any questions, I'll see if I can answer them. Any other random tips and tricks? Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's choosing a good branch for the air layer is so crucial as well. Um, also, after you have girdled the top and the bottom of the hole, uh, I mean of the uh, the wound, um, taking off that middle collar of bark is really important. That you've got every last bit. I mean, you saw me on the video furiously scratching with the uh, blade. Um, I really wish I had uh, this other failed air layer to show you because that was one where I had missed that there still was one green hair um, connecting the top and the bottom. And if that plant has a chance of doing that, uh, of reconnecting and getting its plumbing going again, that's what that plant is going to do. It does not want to uh, make roots independently. Because what you're really doing is just isolating the plumbing at the top of your air layer. And that, that branch, if it wants to keep on living, is going to have to make its own roots. And the auxins in the uh, ring hormone sort of show it how to do that, but it doesn't work every time. We have a question from chat. They want to know if you can air layer edema or can the branch or the branches too thin? Uh, no, Elena, I think we'll probably grow from cuttings. I, it, yeah, a lot of Elena, it's such a, 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 a small plant. I mean, we do have some shrub Elenas here that would probably grow from cuttings as well. I mean, air layering is something you do when you can't grow it from cuttings. So definitely try cuttings first. And Elena, I think would probably work from, from cuttings, mm -hmm. even small pieces. You always wanna balance though, when you're doing cuttings, you don't wanna to have too many leaves up there. For air layers, that's not the case. The more leaves, the better. But for cuttings, you can actually stress that cutting too much by all the water that's going to uh, move out of the leaves. Um, it'll be too much if you have too many leaves. Mm -hmm. So you want a lot of the moisture in that plant to go towards root development. Yeah, I've I've done a lot of air layers in the hibiscus family, and. Often things uh, in the coffee family require air layering, but I should say that most hibiscus will grow from cuttings quite easily. It's when we get into uh, butylons or certain uh, hard to grow uh, hybrids of hibiscus, they sometimes don't have the oomph to produce their own roots in cuttings. So you have to use this other technique where you're sort of allowing the roots of that plant to still provide a lot of the, the moisture. Um, and that's what's happening in air layering. Yeah, any other questions, anybody? Uh, they say, mahalo me, and they're gonna apply this just to old hibiscus in their yards. Perfect, good. Please try and stop by for any questions if you want. Mm -hmm. We're okay. Six days a week. Mm -hmm. People say mahalo, they're excited to try. Good. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a fun technique. Once you know how to air layer, you're never going to starve because everybody has fruit trees that they love in their yard. And for you to be able to make duplicates of that for them, mm -hmm. that's just a wonderful gift that you can always give. Mm -hmm. So air layering is something that, boy, it'll just if you learn this technique, and it does take constant practice at first, it's something that'll pay for itself. Oh, so two questions. Mm, okay. Um, people want to know, uh, once there's roots, can you cut it off and plant? And is there a best time of year to start? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've always thought that the springtime, the lengthening days, is a factor that helps air layers. 
But, you know, I had great success with many air layers I put on the, the past fall. Uh, um, a lot of them didn't live in the nursery, but they did at first. You get what I'm saying? Um, yeah, that was only part of that question now. Um, what was the rest of that question? Um, once you have roots on it, you just cut it off and plant it? No, definitely not. Okay. You want to put it in a, so in a pot of soil, a good. Uh, I usually use a half and half sphagnum moss and perlite mixture. I mean, a half and half uh, uh, number four mix and perlite, because you really want this to drain well. And I would keep it in a half gallon pot until you see roots coming out of the bottom of that pot, then transfer it to a one gallon pot, maybe for a month. And once you see roots coming out of the bottom of that pot, then it's ready for the soil. So it's, it's a process. Once you have a good air layer, it's probably gonna be another two months until you get it into the ground properly. You don't wanna plant it immediately because it is just too fragile. The second question, somebody else had? Uh, okay. Oh, how many roots do you have to see before knowing it's ready to transplant? Uh, you know, sometimes for things that are really rare, <laughs> I am so happy just to see one root, but it's a good idea to let more than one um, develop. And, uh, you know, just the more the merrier but you don't want to get it to the point where it uses up all the nutrition in that rooting uh, sphere that you've made. So it's really kind of a judgment call. Once you see three or four, then it's perfectly fine to chop that off because there's plenty that you're not seeing. Yeah, you know, there's another thing that I didn't get to in this whole thing. Uh, I hope we still have people here that um, a lot of people suggest completely covering the air layer with silver foil afterwards and just blocking off all the light to those roots because light kills roots in many cases. And I have not done that consistently at Waimea often because we have minor birds here and they see that foil and oh boy, this is great uh, uh, nesting material. So minor birds just can pick apart uh, the silver foil and then break the plastic underneath it. And so what I do is when I put on the second sheet of plastic to act like kind of a raincoat or an umbrella for the air layer, that seems to provide enough shade that roots still grow. They want to know what's the average amount of time to get past the air layer? Yeah, about two months and uh, less than two months, you might see the first roots. It really depends because the two things that we potted up today, they had been on for almost four months and that's unusual. And, you know, sometimes I will forget a plant that has an air layer on it and I'll come and find that the roots actually grew and used up all the nutrients in that root air layering and then the whole branch died. And that was the tragic case for a very rare plant from Africa mm -hmm. uh, recently. Uh, can you go over again what factors go into selecting a good place to put the air layer? So the vertical branch? Right yeah, a vertical branch also with plenty of leaves on the top because all those are gonna be supplying your energy for root formation and in a place where it's accessible, that you can look around all sides of that air layer that you've just been, because just by feel, you can't tell for sure if there's a little green fiber on the far side of that air layer that might be allowing nutrients to go back and forth between the, the across the juncture of the plant. So I've actually, in some cases, brought out a little mirror with me so I can, if I can't get my head around that thing, I can look at it, uh, the back of it with a mirror. Uh, yeah, really important to make sure nothing's bridging that gap between the two parts of the branch that you've just separated. Uh, the shade or exposure to elements Yeah, um, generally you're air, air layering things that need that sunlight to uh, photosynthesize and make those roots. So usually you're air layering in full sun. And with any plant, you know, late afternoon sun can just, you know, be too much. Uh, always plants usually prefer morning light. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. We're gonna be doing this again with some of my travels 
We have uh, already done a South American one, but coming up will be India and Myanmar, China, Indonesia, Thailand, lots of places that I traveled as a backpacker back in the 70s and 80s. And too bad people can't do that again nowadays. You're welcome. Thanks everybody for tuning in.